our lovely audience here at home. I'm going to keep the webcam off today just to conserve computer resources. And start with something light but pretty insightful this morning. We're going to talk a little bit, as is our tradition across the last events, to discuss a little bit what's going on between the left ear and the right ear. Many of you are successful traders in your own right, and some of you here today are struggling and earlier on along the path to success than others of you. And we wanted to do something a little bit different uh, this time around versus historically in the past we've talked about um, hacking your brain in the sense of are there things that you can do as a human being to increase the odds of success relative to trading psychology and a lot has been said on the subject the popular author Mark Douglas um, were trading a religion his book trading in the zone would probably be the first book of that Bible and has been the cornerstone for many people in their journey towards success the idea that you are not so much required to be right or wrong but required to exploit a statistical edge that repeats over and over again this idea that success is not winning or losing so much as following the rules of your trading system mechanically at first and then mechanically and intuitively second and then finally intuitively third only after you've mastered the first two areas and so today in the spirit of statistics we wanted to bring things back to a breakdown of what we've learned one of the advantages of being a vendor and a developer is our exposure to you and to your peers in the community who are either attempting to trade profitably or trading profitably so in that sense we are a clearinghouse and a, a deposition of information um, a priest if you will where confessions are made and kept sacrosanct and holy and in other cases we're uh, a broadcasting agency where with permission we share what we're doing and what others are doing and incorporate that into our methods or pass it directly along to you as Bob shared yesterday and Greg will share with us this afternoon but we wanted to go deeper because there appeared to be no correlation between who was successful and who wasn't there appeared to be at first no distinctions between um, education relative to success or income relative to success or age relative to success there appeared to be no commonalities and the first port part of this webinar I want to share some of the things that we've learned in terms of how we've profiled you as our customer we've heard the same things repeated over and over again relative to a traders journey of success so we want to focus today on understanding your hard wiring and in a moment we're going to all take an online quiz it's going to seem very quirky at first you're not required to share your results with anyone and the information we'll share today based on many of you will also be anonymous as to not embarrass anyone or inflate anyone's egos as well and you'll find when we arrive at the end that we'll have learned a little bit about ourselves many of you have probably already even taken this survey at one point but never in the context presented here today first thing I want to talk about is this big number and when we first started on our trading journey this 80 to 85 percent number was out there and 
I liken the statistic to an example I give new traders. And I would say on average 10% to 20% of people who find us are in that first six-month phase of their journey. And I ask them very honestly, detecting the eagerness in their voice, if they knew there was an 85% chance of getting hit by lightning, if they left their house that particular day, would they leave their house? And the answer is, of course, uh, enthusiastically, no. But they will parenthetically run forward into the street outside of their statistical house to trade the money that they're virtually guaranteed to lose. And so at one point we started questioning the statistics. We're very antithetical here. We are contrarian and conspiratorial by nature. I find Ron and I, we click very well that way. And we started asking our contacts in the industry how valid this number really is. Is this just an old wives tale that had been passed along from some old guy on some old trading floor somewhere and everybody passed it along in a game of telephone. And so we called three or four brokerages that we worked with. One in particular we were very close friends with. And the number is actually wrong. It's closer to 90 percent. One broker said it's almost 95. And that is extremely disheartening but yet there are people running out into the street holding a six-foot aluminum rod in their hands declaring enthusiastically it won't be me and that's a very important and sobering statistic to start with because one of the things we realize the commonality of people who aren't successful is their willingness to lose money in light of an overwhelming statistic there's very little difference between that person whom I can identify on the phone now after six years in about a minute and a half and I tell them flatly why don't you just write me a check for the account balance of your account and they say well what for I said I will buy something nice and I will send you a picture of me using it and enjoying it and this way you'll at least know where your money went and they chuckle a little uncomfortably and realize I'm serious. <laughs> it's a very important, odd, odd, um, very important statistic moving into the context of what we're about to show here. Because the people who hear that statistic and step back and say, well, what should I do? Those are the ones that have a dramatically higher success rate that we've seen, at least in the course development throughout the flux systems and training that person who says well I'm not going to trade a single dollar live until I've accomplished X or accomplished Y there's a story in the book uh, the new market wizards 2 by Jack Schwager or uh, it's either that book or one called the market millionaires and the author recants a story of a trader from West Africa who had moved to the States after having had his real estate business uh, closed down via embezzlement from his real estate partner. And when he came to America, he left with $1,500, uh, loans that he had taken from everyone in his family that he was going to use to trade Forex. And he understood the odds. These were the last $1,500 that anyone in his family or circle of friends had uh, available beyond daily needs. And when he went home at night from his office job, he had determined that he would open a SIM account with his brokerage in the Forex world. He took a $1,500 SIM account and he would double it. And the author goes on to describe that his trading system was only 5 to 10 pips a day. And until he had doubled his account three times, he resolved in his heart he would never risk a single penny of his family's money live. And so he took the $1,500 account to 3000 and reset the money. He took the $1,500 SIM account to 3000 a second time and reset the money manager. And then the third time, he resolved in his heart that he was prepared to trade live and risk the money 
uh, loaned to him by his friends and family. Those people that we've encountered in our journey with you and with others that have come alongside of us and then left us, that one statistic, that one characteristic is a defining precursor. So take that to heart as we move deeper into our quest to understand the successful trader's brain here today. <clears throat> the second statistic that emerged consistently in our pursuit of understanding the successful trader's mind and the struggling trader's pursuit of success was the time frame of failure. Most brokerages in the five to six that we surveyed told us that most traders don't make it past the 90 day mark before account blowout. They said each time that the 90 day mark was being quote unquote generous and you could almost hear how reserved they were in their attempt to not uh, enthusiastically emphasize most people don't make it past the first month. So in our conversations with people, that 85 to 90 percent lightning rod wielding about to lose grandma's inheritance money person, they're quite often times the brokerages and the vendors especially that we've come to know and disdain in many cases are fully aware of this 30 to 60 day statistic and they will tell you that many of the marketing practices that exist i.e. giving away a free 30 day trial giving away something for 995 to get you into the system is essentially a concept related to the movie the green mile this idea of dead man walking when traders approach brokerages and many of the marketing based vendors online there is an awareness that they have 30 to 60 days from that first account balance opening to the trader leaving the arena completely and so many of the practices that you see today are yes as a result of deception among uh, unscrupulous developers and education companies but that's tied directly to this statistic most new people have a shelf life that doesn't last more than 45 to 60 days and again when people come into it with an awareness that encompasses this their odds of failure versus success diminish greatly when we meet someone for example on the first time who says things like I'm starting to trade I'm giving myself a couple years to get this under my belt. The odds of their success increase dramatically and we've seen them arise through that process and stay in Ron's room for one, two, three years and arrive at the break even plus point. The trader who comes in and in that 30 to 60 day period says things like, I need to do this to augment my income. I need to generate $250 a day. I need to make $1,000 a week. I just lost my job and I have to learn how to trade by the 30th. Those people, it's not even a statistic, it's almost a guarantee that they'll be failure. One of the other things we uncovered <laughs> is that while they won't admit it publicly on the telephone in a very hush-hush voice, most of the brokerages will tell you that the majority of their over the majority of their operational budget is directed towards marketing and finding new people and so there's correlation between the psychological pitfalls of trading and how much money there is out there luring people into this industry so this sort of confirms what we've been learning about people's experiences. This idea of we'll give you money, we'll let you trade with $500 in your account. You can do this, you can do that. And the commissions are getting smaller and smaller. And we're seeing more and more people come in running out into the street with a lightning rod. There's good news. <laughs> it's not all bad. And I want to share with you the empirical observations that Ron and I have made across the last going on six years and 1,500 plus customers. About two to three people a week sign up with us. And over the course of that first 
30, 60, 90, 120 day period in our conversations with you, we've learned via the customers who report being break even plus profitable, uh, there are several commonalities. And these are very noteworthy if you drill down into them and take nothing away from this morning. These are important to understand and reflect on later. Consistently, 75 plus percent of the time, when asked how long did it take you to reach break even plus profitability, 75 plus percent of people will say without reservation or hesitation, it took me three to five years to obtain break even plus. Coming into the trading arena with an anticipation shorter than that greatly diminishes, if not exponentially diminishes, the odds of success of the trader. So a uh, quick show of hands here virtually and in person. How many of you feel that number is fair? Those of you that are trading break even plus. That's a pretty solid response and I got a lot of whys online here. What's interesting to note is that figure correlates directly almost uh, identically to a four-year college degree and you bring in other measurements of success, uh, this idea of 10,000 hours of something before you come good at it became popular uh, in the late 90s, early thousands among educational corporations. The idea that you need to be involved with something 10,000 hours before it clicks. Gan, who we love in terms of his mathematical mind, his most important, my favorite quote, I'll paraphrase here this morning. He said, doctors go to school for eight to ten years to learn how to become a doctor. He said, lawyers go to school for eight to ten years to learn how to become a lawyer. And paraphrasing the final part, he said, people with a lot of money think they're traders because they have a lot of money. And the implication is that you wouldn't go to a doctor who had a bunch of books in the back of his trunk. And he said, well, I've got all these books you would need to know that they had gone through the process. And so the process here amongst six years of conversations across probably five or 6,000 phone calls with me is that that three to five year mark emerges consistently as the point of rollover. And that's consistent with the college degree and with that 10 hour success rule as well. Most of the people who achieved break-even plus report that they spent between $15,000 and $30,000 on trading software and education. So if you've spent less than that, please see Rachel and she'll take the balance of that from you this morning. <laughs> this number is pretty consistent among everyone that we spoke to. I won't ask people to raise their hands or type the letter Y because it's almost embarrassing. Um, if we go back to our houses and look at our books and our hard drives on the shelf or in the computers, um, I have the wonderful, and Rachel has the wonderful privilege of working directly with you on your computers when we work to set you up. And there's what I call the Cherokee Trail of Tears. And when I scroll down to the flux indicators in your system, I'm passing about a dozen different vendors along the way. I can name them all in sequence. I've pretty much figured out what everybody here has purchased before they got to us. And there are six vendors who have consistently um, lured people in for whatever reason or another, not implying they're bad or good, but most of the people here today within the sound of my voice have 80% of the time the same six to 10 companies worth of indicators on their computer, totaling between 15 and $30,000. So the next question is probably a little more revealing. Most of the traders, in addition to the software, blew up two to three trading accounts. So this is a pretty common uh, point to make and relative to Ron's discussion yesterday stands out as one of the most 
um, noteworthy statistics to keep in mind, which is when asked, what would you tell someone who was learning how to trade like you learned how to trade? The overwhelming majority of people when asked that question will say, I would tell that young person, that younger version of me, to preserve precious capital. Another way they've phrased it, they've said, I would tell myself that every day I wasn't losing money, I was one day closer to understanding how to win money. The idea that money management, more so than anything they learned in their education, more so than anything they had on their hard drives in terms of software, the idea that every day they were closer to that four-year mark without losing their account was a good thing. The idea that the trade you take where you don't lose money is still a winner. And it seems that in the early phases, there's an adolescent phase of trading where we're taught either through vendors that we've worked with or by our peers that if we're not trading live money, then we're not moving forward in our success. But the overwhelming odds show that in that vein, you will lose your account two to three times. Most of the people can't refund their account that many times as well. And when someone says, I'm starting out with a two or three thousand dollar account, the odds of their success are pretty low. Most people that move on to break even plus start with a seventy five hundred to a ten thousand dollar account minimally towards their pursuit of success. The third most common piece of advice given to us when asked what would you say to traders who are below break even plus at this stage, they would say almost enthusiastically every single time, if someone was starting out with a $10,000 account and that's all they had to trade with, they would tell them to take $5,000 and fund their account they told them to take the other $5,000 and put it in a CD, put it in a bank, put it in a box and bury it in the backyard under a heavy rock because the odds of losing that first count are so dramatically high that if you don't have anything left to continue fighting and learning, you won't achieve break-even profitable. And so they tell you if you have a $100,000 account and you fund it when you first start, you'll lose $100,000 in something called the trader's death spiral. The idea that you break down from 100 to 75 to 50, and then when you get to 50, you start making desperate decisions and averaging in. You say to yourself, well, I'll trade 10 contracts instead of 5 to get from 50 back to 100. And then you find yourself at 25000 and then you let it ride on one big trade because Uncle Earl had a good piece of advice. You're down to $1,500, and you say, the hell with this, and close it out. That number can be 100000 it can be 10 it can be 5 and the result is the same. Something happens here relative to self-sabotage that prevents you from moving forward. When asked about this, most traders who are break even plus will tell you keep the money in reserve that you will almost in assuredly need having gone through this spiral at least once so that piece of advice there take that with you move forward one of the other resounding commonalities among break even plus traders is the fact that when asked what are you trading will say I trade a very simple system simple relative to what most people are taught and or demonstrated online in a webinar in a seminar on a book they'll have three indicators or less on their chart and most often they have fewer than three charts or watch fewer than two or three instruments simultaneously. Their simple system is clear enough where you could stand perhaps three or four feet back from the screen and or intuitively understand without explanation what they're doing. They'll say to the sub break even plus trader 
If you have much more on your screen beyond that, you'll use the other indicators on your chart to, quote, talk yourself out of, unquote, the trade you should take. And so they've learned via the psychology process they've gone through, the more indicators on your screen, the higher your chances of failure as opposed to success. There's actually a break-even point, and it appears across the last six years to be around three indicators on the chart at any one point in time. Now, some of you have what I call a Las Vegas chart. You have 10 or 12 indicators on your screen. It's a carnival, a festival uh, on the screen, and you are in a very narrow window, but for some of you it works, and I'm not saying that you're doing something wrong. I'm just noting, having gone on most of your screens in the last six years, those of you that are profitable don't have much more than three, maybe four indicators on your chart. This is probably the favorite, my favorite notice, uh, my favorite commonality. When you talk to someone who's break-even profitable, and I've heard and overheard some of the conversations here yesterday and over lunch, when they talk about their system, they're talking about it as though they're describing one of their children to you. Let me tell you about my system. And they're one step away from opening their wallet or their purse and pulling out five pictures. This is me and my system in Disney. And this is, oh, this is the time we went to Mexico. So it's, I can't even tell you. Exactly. And it's, it's hilarious. It's, see how everyone is chuckling and people at home are saying the same thing. You arrive at the mysterious break-even point noticing something that no one else in the room seemingly sees. I call it the wiggle. And when someone talks to me, they'll say, you ever notice on gold how when you see this candle, it does this little wiggle? It all, and then they'll comma, it almost always fill in the blank. And the wiggle could be anything. They'll say, do you ever notice how when the CCI on the five Renko breaks zero, it almost always blank? Do you ever notice when the 89 EMA on the uh, 184 tick CL chart breaks above and then goes back down? It almost always, and so one of the most important things that we can teach in this session to you is that there is no set procedure. Um, someone here recanted a story, well-known uh, turtle trader, um, I think it was uh, Bill Dennis, said that I could put the rules of our trading system which were making tens of millions of dollars at the time on the Wall Street Journal's front page, and in 30 days it wouldn't matter because nobody would trade them. Nobody would trade our rules. And that observation decades ago is consistent with what we see today, which is that when we're demonstrating the Flux software, we've learned that we never show it the same way twice, or we show multiple ways and options and uh, multiple methods of incorporating the same data. That because each of you has, for lack of a better term, a wiggle. And that wiggle is inconsistent across the entire customer range of experience. In fact, no two traders in our entire experience are trading the same mechanical system in any of our conversations with you. No two people are saying, I trade the milk the cow system with a five tick stop and a 30 tick target. And I know Judy trades that and I know Bill trades that. Every one of you is using a different wiggle. Some of you here are trading together or uh, I won't mention any names, Gary and Julia. You live in the same house and admittedly trade completely different systems and I've learned that that's a good thing, and anything keeps uh, you in check with your trading partners. So James and John, you'll see that in your experiences as brothers as well. We've had father-son teams, brother teams, best friend teams, spouse teams, and in the same house with the same tools, two different computers, same information, same teaching. 
you'll each see a different wiggle. And that is disturbing. From a vendor standpoint, from an educational standpoint, what do you do with that? How do you help someone forward in terms of identifying that wiggle? And it usually comes around that three to four year mark. Sometimes sooner, never usually much later, but somewhere around there somebody says, ah, then they'll take that vendor's list of indicators and maybe incorporate something from MT Predictor with an Elliott Wave. Maybe they'll bring something in from Trade Guider with some volume spread analysis. Maybe they'll bring in a trending indicator from Hawkeye or something that they purchased from Indicator Warehouse. Just something that's substandard. We love my wiggle, but we bring this thing along just in case to keep the stops moving. It's never as important, though, as that one thing that you notice. So learning from that, we encourage people, if you stripped everything away off your computer, I call it the deserted island theorem, if you could only take one thing with you to the deserted island right now, what in your experience has resonated most closely with you? What one indicator would that be? And so for me, it would be a, a MACD dot or a time cycle marker indicator. I can do everything I need with that tool. For some of you, it might be a moving average. For some of you, it might be something as simple as a 50 MA. I met a trader once who trades crude. He makes between $1,000 and $3,000 a day with nothing but a 50 period moving average. I said, Bill, how do you trade that? He said, Mike, when it's above the 50, I buy. When do you sell? when it's below the 50 and it should have been very obvious to me and you kind of have to leave it there because in his mind there are subtle rules and things that he does that are completely undescribable he's gone from a mechanical to an intuitive subconscious phase where he can't even tell you why but he knows the way the 50 moves the angle of the line the curvature of the line this is where I need to get in this is where I need to get out so don't shortchange yourself in that process. The next question is where we're going to sort of take that online survey together. And some really dramatic results came from this study. When we sat down about six months ago to start getting ready for this, we had been probably for the last year been compiling information based on a theory that we had. That theory originated from a conversation we had with someone we'd met in India, of all places, who had come to serve where we had served in the southern Himalayan region and had a background in education and human psychology. And there's not a lot to do when it's dark there and when the uh, dinner is finished, you just talk. And this one conversation that we had led to a really deep understanding of ourselves and a lot of the strengths and weaknesses that Ron and I had uh, unknowingly come together and complemented with regards to the results of this test. So what I'd like you to do, if you have your PC up, is go to Google. And when you get to Google, I want you to type online personality test. And before you leap to any conclusions and say, oh, I know what this is, and oh, I know that, just hang with me. And if you Google online personality tests, there'll be a link for one that says humanmetrics.com. It'll either be the second or third one on the list. So if you want to get even more detailed, you can say online personality test, human metrics, all one word. And that'll be the first thing that comes up. So when it comes up, I'll paste the link into you uh, for those of you that are following along at home. And reserve judgment until after you've taken the test and see the results for uh, what we've uncovered relative to asking questions to people who've taken this test. Were you break even 
plus profitable or are you still struggling? So there's about, I want to say 70, 72 questions here. If you answer all of them, I'm going to take the test alongside of you. If you get all the way through to the end, I want you to hit score it and then keep that result to yourself. That's personal, that's private, you don't have to share it with anyone. If you don't have a PC, Ron will work around with you guys. You're gonna, it's, uh, you're gonna go to Google and then type online personality test and if you want to get very specific the phrase is human metrics like the metrics system metric system and then you'll have a link that comes up humanmetrics.com forward slash cji dash win forward slash jtypes2 dot asp so let's set uh, 10 minutes aside for that. The advice given to people taking the test is if there isn't a perfect answer, pick the one that most closely describes the affirmative. So if you're not sure, a lot of times it could be 60-40, 70-30, pick the one that you feel most resonant with and then move on. So we'll go ahead, let you guys do that, ladies do that. And at 9.10, we'll come back and take a look. Like a river with 
Okay, about five minutes to go. You should be about halfway done or more. couple more minutes we'll get back to it Okay, everybody ready? 
Anybody still working on it? Shoot your hand up. Okay, we'll do a couple more minutes. No rush. <clears throat> Anybody still going? Okay, it looks like we're pretty close. Well, you see where mine is. Not all of you can be as awesome as I am, but I figure we got to start somewhere. So we took these tests. Mine came back with ENFP. Ron, what did yours come back with? ISTP. And so you have a crazy, maniacal, creative person. And then you have the scientist or the mechanic. And when we took these tests, everything that I sucked at, Ron was good at, in everything that worked virtually opposite was the same. And we realized that there was something to this. And what's fascinating about the process, what, whether or not you give it credence or believe in it, is that we were able to ask the people who were profitable versus break even below and struggling that same question. And so here's what we've learned. We surveyed 73 traders, which is a pretty decent sized pool. And we kept track of their answers as opposed to the four letters. So when you get a result back, you'll see that there are four different letters involved, extroverted, intuitive, feeling, and perceiving, in my case. And if you know your number or your letters, rather, forgive me, you can go back and type those four letters into Google and you'll be surprised at the results that come back from that. And they've broken out those four letters into a total of, I believe it's 16 different personality types. Now some trivia here noteworthy, when you look at the number of people available via all of the different categories you'll see that there are more of certain personality types than others and there are a very narrow number of particular personality types that you'll see are drawn percentage-wise to trading in a way that we didn't foresee. So let me blow this up. 
I didn't even think to put this in here. This is in women. We don't care about those, right? Oh, did you say that? Let's, it's about the same with men, too. So when you compare this pie chart to the percentage of different blood types available, it actually looks about the same. So there's something to this process. Let me blow it up just so you can take a look and see where you are in that kind of pie chart. So I'm, I'm over here in the lower left quadrant. ISTP runs up here on the other side of the color wheel. And one of these slices um, has a really good chance of success as a trader. And let me show you what we found. If you are an INTJ trader, if you are a male INTJ trader, you fill a relatively small slice of the pie. See that little red slice right here? In order of sequence, it's in the four most narrow by population percentage categories available. INFJ is the weirdest person. ENFJ, I'm sorry, the least frequently observed personality type. And then INTJ is kind of right there at the very narrow bandwidth. However, by percentage of traders, 81% of INTJ traders report being net profitable at this point in their career. So we can take sort of two, was, are you an INTJ? Okay. Well, there's some conclusions that can be drawn from that. One, the letters in the four letter breakdown reveal even more uh, information. If you're an IN, you're an introverted, intuitive trader just those first two letters infers a 60% chance of success versus 40% of IN traders who are struggling. And we didn't expect to see any of this. It's sort of like the SETI stuff. You think, well, we'll take a shot and see if something sticks. If you're a J trader, if you have a J in your letter, format, bring forward. I don't know why that didn't work. Interesting. There is a 65% chance of success as opposed to a 35% chance of struggling or being sub break even. So the J part of it allows you, if you look through the details of each of these letters, you see the world logically. You're making decisions based on rational observations as opposed to emotions and sensing and perceiving things. If you're an introverted person, there was a 67% chance of success among your peers as opposed to extroverted people. So nearly 7 out of 10 traders surveyed, are you successful break-even plus or sub-break-even? Nearly 7 out of 10 people came back with an I in that question. It's pretty fascinating, right? So let's look at the J side or the T side. A lot of those questions, I call them Spock versus Captain Kirk questions. Do you think and perceive the world like Spock or do you perceive the world like Kirk? kind of throwing himself into an emotional mix versus standing back and analyzing. The T traders are the Spock traders. 
And those are just people who are hardwired one way or another to perceive the world logically. They make decisions based on structure. They make decisions based on statistical outcomes as to, I got a good feeling about this. Okay. Now, if you have an F <laughs> in your four letters, you're in good company with me, but only 33% of us are currently at a break-even plus profitable portion in our career. If you are a feeling trader, it is a nightmare for you placing live trades in the market. You sense and perceive every tick. You infer things. You may even hear your mother or father's voice yelling at you, telling you, I told you not to do this. You're no good. Why can't you be more like your sister? There's a circus playing in your brain when you trade, as opposed to the T trader. And then finally, if you're an FP, Actually, no one said they were successful as an FP. I put the orange sliver there as a piece of hope. For <laughs> so you're saying there's a chance. No one who was an FP came back and said, I am break-even plus profitable. So this creates, I believe, an opportunity to understand paths moving forward. And here's some of the things that we've learned. The INTJs, you could give them a 50 period moving average and lock them in a room and they'll figure out how to use it. They on the fly intuitively make judgments with discretion about where the market's going to go and are able to make decisions with proper money management ideas. The feeling perceiving traders can't do that. So some of the weaknesses for the people who aren't in the ideal personality category relate back to some of the things that we've talked about and we specifically wanted to do this seminar after the rapid fire indicator for example. Feeling traders, perceiving traders, non-thinking, non-judging, extroverted traders are much more likely to achieve success when automating as much of the decision-making process as possible. And so the traders that are successful in the feeling, perceiving, or extroverted categories will tell you that they are either following a very explicit mechanical rule system or have stepped out to hire a programmer to create a semi-automated or an automated strategy where it takes the trades for them. They're responsible for pushing the button. I've met uh, traders who will hire someone at minimum wage to come to their house and hit the button when their signal comes up because they're that anxious about a system they develop that they know works, that they make money, and they'll sit in the next room and let a, a young man or woman just hit the mouse button. When that arrow shows up, you hit buy. That arrow shows up, you hit sell. And so those of you that have that ability, if you have a spouse that compliments you in the T or the I or the J or the uh, IN combinations, it's okay to pair up with someone like that because oftentimes in the feeling perceiving extroverted categories you are extremely creative you see the things you identify the patterns but acting on them comes with consequence the consequence comes with emotions that for you are expressed and felt much deeper than the spocks in the INTJ category and that's not a good or a bad thing. It is what it is. But identifying that weakness or that roadblock that prevents you from acting on that can be uh, crucial into understanding your programming, your uh, what Greg was calling your software, your internal software. You're that for a reason, and that's good. But 
maybe we need an add-on. Maybe we need to build a subroutine that gets us past that warning signal that comes up as cortisol in our chest when you go, <gasps> I was telling Gig earlier that I used to work at a fund where the manager came over and felt my chest. He didn't tell me why he was touching me. I thought it was a sexual harassment suit waiting to happen, in which case, woohoo! But he said, every time I come in the room, I see the blood drain from your head down into your neck when you're in a trade, and I can watch your shirt because your heart is beating out of your chest. This is just working with me for a couple months, watching me trade a system that I had built, that I had back-tested five, six hundred iterations of. I knew exactly what it would do and not do, and every time it came time to push the button, <sighs> all of those feelings and emotions rise to the surface. For some of you, it just goes quiet and dark. It's a cold steel battlefield, and you feel the energy, but it does nothing to you emotionally. So in that category of struggling traders, one of the other things that emerges as important is an ATM strategy, something that manages the trade for you when you're in it. Because as a feeling trader, as an extroverted or a perceiving trader, you see possibilities in everything because you're creative. This is why having fewer indicators on your screen, especially if you fall into those categories, is important. If you have something on your screen like a volume chart and the flux told you to get long, you will watch the volume chart to get out of the trade, to look for danger. You're constantly bringing information in and trying to perceive how will this hurt me or the people that I love and your brain will send up caution signs and stop signs and warning signals. So A, reducing the number of possible distractions is extremely important for you. You'll find when you're working throughout the day or even trading, you like to browse online a lot. You'll check your Facebook account. You'll look down at your phone. You're thinking about the vacation you're going to take in two weeks. That neighbor didn't say hi when they drove by yesterday and didn't wave. You don't really like them, but maybe they were having a bad day. You'll give them a chance. Your world is a world of possibilities, and trading is the exact opposite for you. The second side of that is you hate mechanical structure. You hate the mundane. You hate routines. You hate the minutia of doing the same thing over and over and over again. I know for me that's a personal struggle. I met a trader last uh, year who had the same personality type as me. He was trading between ten and $50,000 profitable a day. He was up 50 grand, it was 355, and he was mad. He said, I've been sitting here all blankety blank day, and I'm bored out of my blank in mind. I want to get out of here and play golf. He's up $50,000. Well, when you lose, what's your maximum limit? Well, if I lose 10K, I'm done for the day. I hit that yesterday, and I had the whole day free. It was great. <laughs> Exactly. Now imagine 5,000 of those conversations and you'll start to understand why we're crazy. There is a direct correlation for you in those three categories equivalent to minutia, repetition, mechanical things that will force your brain to do things subconsciously to sabotage you. What is it going to take for me to get you out of this office and do some fun stuff? I have some ideas about how to organize the garage, if you're interested, if you can get away from this computer for a minute. Where the INTJ, the IN, the T, the J traders are in the moment, they will tell you things like, I feel energized by the market. It's a Rubik's Cube that they solve every day. They don't like the idea that the market can take money from them that they can't get back. It's mechanical. It's scientific. It's the kid who took apart his mother's washing machine and put it back together again. You see how it works. It bothers you that you don't know how it works. And when you find the puzzle key piece, you're able to operate mechanically. So if you're in that other, you're in that other category, a workspace, a workspace like the one Ron showed you is important, where if you're using a broadhead signal after a time cycle marker, all of that accountability now is back on NinjaTrader. Your trail stop is following according to the ATM 
all of that responsibility is back there. It may mean taking the system that you have and hiring a programmer to create a strategy for you that puts you in the market when your signal comes, where you don't have that hesitancy to hit the button and or move your stops and targets once you're in. I had a manager in that same company who was an extroverted feeling manager, completely opposite of the other man. And I would sit there with this new strategy that I developed. It was in place. It made about $600 a day in the YM with two contracts. And his desk was five feet to the right of me. I would sit there, and then the other partner came in later because he was trading Forex from the night before. And it traded from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern. And right around 10.30, the feeling manager would say, hey, how you doing on that system? Say, uh, I'm doing pretty good. It's up about uh, five hundred dollars. How much? Uh, how much more time does that thing got? It's got about twenty minutes. Mm, oh, okay. Well, why don't you close the auto trader out right now? Because you're probably not going to make much more money in the next twenty minutes. You might even lose some of it. Uh, okay. And I would close it. Order filled. And then two seconds after I closed it the Dow would go up 130 ticks in the direction of the trade that I was in. And the 130 ticks turned out to be what I needed to get profitable over the losers of the next day. And every day he would say, wow, you just had a big trade right there. Why don't you, uh, why don't you book those profits and we'll go get some breakfast. And it was unnerving to be next to another crazy person like me who was feeling it seemingly times 10. At one point, the other partner came in and I said to him, I need you to do something for me, Nick. And he said, what? I said, I need you to fire me. He said, what are you talking about? I need you to tell me that if you catch me moving a stop or a target or altering this automated system between 8 and 11, that you're going to let me go. Because I think that's the only thing that's going to keep me from hitting that button. And you need to talk to the crazy guy over here and tell him if he wants to close the position, he can come over and hit the left mouse button because I'm not going to do it. I have to know that I can go 30 days without touching this system, win, lose, or draw. And then in that moment, I realized for me as a perceiving person, as an extroverted person, as a feeling person, each day was the equivalent of an Alcoholics Anonymous chip you read about and hear about the 30-day chip. And I'm not saying that it's the same. I don't equivocate the two. But as far as an analogy goes, I needed to know I could go at least 30 days without touching that if I was ever going to make it doing this. Because every time I touched it and perceived or sensed that the market was going to do something, it always, we analyzed the last six days of times I'd moved it, it never worked in my favor. Every decision and judgment I made based on what I perceived did the exact opposite. It either cut a big winner short or it made a small loser huge. And that's part of the struggle of being in that category. You will inevitably be lured into the traps set for you by the computers, by the institutions, whatever you want to blame. Those are designed for you. And if you look at the odds there are a lot more of you than there are of these little guys, the INTJs. So if you're setting a trap for somebody, you're profiling a personality type, look at all the E's over here. There's way, look at the FPs rather than the TJs. Look at the FJs. Look at the FPs. That's almost a third or a quarter of the chart more. Those are the people funding the commercials we see at Christmas when the guy gives his wife a Lexus in the driveway. That's where that money goes. They're not getting them from the INTJs. By percentage, you're funding those traps. So the INTJs... Um, if you go through and look at their weaknesses, part of it is the, uh, the very scientific part of them that um, becomes 
their savior also becomes a detriment to them. That once they've solved the puzzle, they want to move on to the next thing. One of the INTJ personality type problems that a good friend of mine has is he'll completely master something. He built his wife this amazing garden. It has this mulch layer that has to be five and a half inches, and then there has to be three and a half inches of a certain kind of potting soil, and then I have a certain pH level, and he grew a watermelon the size of a Volkswagen, and he was done. What's next? And he had, and he confessed, I'm always thinking about the next project. So if that is part of who you are, if you're that person of, I've conquered France, now let's move on to England, now let's move on to, and it's this game of risk in your head. Part of the struggle is, I've mastered the system that makes money, I go outside of that zone now to try to master a new system, instead of sticking with what is essentially a scientific ATM machine that works. So you can get completely bogged down in the minutia of something that you've already solved and you've lost interest in. So that can be, as reported by some of these traders, a big problem for you. And a lot of people, when they've got to that mechanical side, will build an auto strategy. We have one trader in Texas. He's got a collection of uh, 12 auto strategies. Three or four of them are flux strategies. And he just plugs them in and pulls them out. And he walks in the next room and closes out his positions each day because he doesn't. he's bored sitting at the screen making money. And so getting past that need to be excited and solve a new puzzle, if you're an INTJ or an IN, an intuitive or thinking trader, can be a big hurdle for you. So um, develop a system that works, execute it mechanically, but allow yourself the freedom to explore other things. Don't trade them with live money, paper trade them, have a side project, create a list of things that you're going to learn, that you're going to do, courses that you're going to take, books that you're going to read, distract that part of your brain that needs to be creative and solve new scientific puzzles, but allow the part of you that created a system and can follow it mechanically to earn the living while the crazy part of you that needs to cure cancer is out doing other things in the world. Jim writes, when I was a kid, my mother got mad at me because I took the toaster apart to see how it worked. I put it back together but wasn't sure what made it work. Okay, there's a lot of us in here who describe that. If you're in this room and you took this survey, eight out of ten of you are Flux customers, which means trading attracts you to something that is seemingly uncrackable and unsolvable. That's really weird, especially when you remember what I said, there's an 85% chance of failure and losing ten to $30,000. So what do we take away from this? Number one, now that you know who you are, this Latin phrase, whatever it is, know thyself, go back and investigate a little bit. You don't have to believe everything that comes along with it. It's not a horoscope. It's just a statistical representation of how people are and how the world plays out. Spend a lot of time looking at the web pages. A lot of times you'll see um, in some of the pages, there's a section here that describes some of the weaker parts of your personality type, things that people in your personality type seemingly struggle with and need personal development on. So for me, I could type ENFP weaknesses, and it'll come back and tell me what most people report. Poor practical skills. My wife is the exact opposite. She pays all the bills. If I had to pay the same bill every week, I'd slit my throat. Find it difficult to focus. Does this describe Michael, the guy at BTTFT? Overthink things. Get stressed easily. Highly emotional. You can listen to it in my voice. It's a roller coaster when I teach. Independent to a fault. Don't micromanage me. It took me 20 years to get away from an overseer, a manager who told me what to do. So go deeper into that personality type. Identify what is it about this that would hurt my trading, and then build a plan. What can I do to improve on this? What kinds of things can I use to avoid the collision with that moment where I sabotage myself? Okay? So in conclusion, those are the stats. 
if you're not in that glorious category with the other Spock gladiators, take hope. There are things you can do, but you need to, as Ron tells me all the time, improvise, adapt, overcome. Focus on the things that I showed you here today that people report as being necessary to success. Focus on your wiggle. Focus on simplicity. Focus on automation whenever possible. Focus on things that take the responsibility of the trade out of your hands and put that accountability into a robotic methodology. Make it as emotionless as you can. Get up and leave the room once you place a trade until you hear stop filled or target filled. Get out of your own way once you've established something that works. Ron says, how did you get yourself to trade trend rather than counter trend? I talked to too many of you. And those of you that said you traded successfully, break even profitably, said you trade with the trend. 70, 75 percent of you said I trade with the trend. If I'm wrong, the market probably goes in my direction anyway. Things like that. And so it took me the better part of five years. It wasn't until about a year, year and a half ago that I started to turn. And maybe in the last 12 to 10 months, you saw the results of that turn in the system that I demoed the other day. The system that had the equity curve that for the first time went in the right direction. This one here. That's about five years of struggling and trying to forget everything the first guy who told me how to trade RSI divergence put in my head. When someone puts a bad idea in your head and you latch onto it and that's your belief, I need to pick tops and bottoms to survive, you'll hold on to that like a life preserver. And so give yourself the freedom and the creativity to go outside of what you're doing if it's not working. Definition of insanity, right? So part of the benefit of being on the journey with you is hearing what's working for those of you that are successful and in moments and sessions like this passing that information along to sort of cut that learning curve short if you're on the other side. 